Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror in detail, the realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story. One night in the woods. I was drinking with some friends a few nights ago, swapping stories from the old times, when my old roommate reminded me of these guys I used to hang out with. Or, as he puts it, that time you hung out with those crazy pagans in the woods. The crazy pagans in question were a coven I crossed paths with while I was living in North Georgia. No one tells you when you're there that there are a lot of non-Christian communes in the North Georgia hills. Given the interests I had at the time, I've met pagans, Wiccans, Druids, and many other practitioners of strange and foreign beliefs. Most are just hobbyists, people with a passing interest who find the mystic section in barns and nobles and go a little nuts. However, some of them take this shit very seriously and, sometimes, take it a little too far. This story is about one of those groups. I had taken an interest in religious studies, and it had led me down a rabbit hole that had led to a general interest in the occult and mysticism. This led to a lot of brooding in the back of my college library, reading over old books, and making notes on strange subjects and odd topics. I had taken an interest in runes, and that was how I met Patrick, or Wormwood as he was calling himself in those days. He was teaching me about runes in exchange for some notes I'd made about energy exchange. We became friends and started hanging out a bit at a coffee shop in Dalanega that catered to that sort of crowd. That was where I met Amadeus. As enamored as I was with the idea of mysticism, Amadeus was weird. I arrived to meet with Patrick one day to find a man in his mid-forties sitting next to him. His gray hair was braided down his back and his bald crown was oiled and gleaming. He wore an honest-to-God traveling cloak, not one of the hot-topic long coats that this crowd usually wore, and his shirt was obscured with silver charms hung on long leather thongs around his neck. He stared at me as I sat down, fingers steepled before his eyes in a decidedly wizardly fashion, and began volleying very probing questions before Patrick could begin introductions. He wanted to know what I knew about everything from runes, to tarot, to demonology, to herbraft, and everything in between. I had studied quite a bit, and I was happy to flex my knowledge for him. So we spent about an hour talking shop. If I'd known what he wanted, I'd have left right then. He must have been impressed with what I had to say. You seem pretty knowledgeable. It appears that Wormwood did not exaggerate your abilities. I'm looking for someone to come into the woods with us for a gathering. I need someone capable of setting up and maintaining a protective circle around our campsite and act as a guide while we await the spirits. I'm willing to pay if you're willing to come out with us for the weekend. We talked a little more about what was expected of me and came to an agreement. I would set up their protective circle, provide scholarly advice, and keep them from wandering into the forest in the event that something took notice of our gathering. This would be a standard gathering for them, some twenty members of their coven coming together, and Amadeus was pretty clear that it could get rowdy. He would give me two hundred and fifty dollars today, and another two hundred fifty at the end for the weekend. As a poor college student, it sounded pretty good to me. I had done similar things before, setting up circles and safeguarding people. It sounded like an easy $500 at the time. I took his money and set about getting a few things together for that weekend. I'd need a few things to pull this off, but I honestly wasn't expecting much more than some drinking in the woods and a bit of babysitting. By Friday, I had assembled my components and made my way to the agreed-upon spot. They had decided not to use an established campground, but instead had decided to camp in a section of woods they claimed to have heard about from someone in our circle. I arrived to find about six other vehicles down an access road, most of them old vans. Just as I was wondering how far into the woods they had gone, 
the door of one of the vans slid open, and out hopped a short blonde woman in a homemade dress. I say short, but she was probably about five feet two inches with a long spill of silver blonde hair. She asked my name, and when I told her, she told me that her name was Andromeda, but I could call her Angie, and that she was my guide for the weekend. Amadeus said I should keep an eye out for you. I'm to assist you in anything you might need this weekend. That should have been a huge red flag, but I kind of shrugged it off at the time. Angie led the way, and we walked about a mile into the woods. She chattered all the way about how much she had been looking forward to this weekend. She said that Amadeus has been researching this area and thought this was a good spot for communing with spirits. The area was reputed for sightings, and the coven was hopeful that they could make contact with whatever lived in these woods. They kept saying coven, but as the campsite came into view, I was beginning to wonder if cult wasn't a better word. The clearing was a circle about 30 feet wide with about 12 tents set up inside. The forest loomed around the campsite, an old forest that seemed to resent having a section of itself gouged out so people could camp. At the center of the tents was a fire pit, a big one, with a lot of styrofoam coolers sitting around it. I could see people bustling around the campsite, making adjustments to tents and setting up sleeping bags. Angie led me to the fire pit where Amadeus was reading a book and smoking what smelled like a joint. He looked at my duffel bag and asked if I'd brought enough supplies to put the circle around the whole campsite. I told him I had, but I was already doing the math and realizing that the sage I had brought would go quickly. He nodded and told me there were more supplies in his tent if I needed them. He also told me that Angie was going to work with me this weekend. Use her in any capacity you see fit, he said, and the lecherous grin was hard to miss. That was red flag number two. Seeing as most of his coven members were women, I was beginning to get a pretty good idea about what sort of setup I had stumbled across. I felt a little squeeby about it, but if they were comfortable with it, then who was I to judge? I had already decided what capacity I would use Angie in that weekend, and whatever ideas Amadeus had didn't figure into them. I wasn't opposed to sleeping with women I had just met, but the idea of sleeping with someone who might not be 100% okay with it was a non-starter for me. I told him I needed to set up my tent, but it was quickly whisked away by a pair of women in homespun dresses who started setting it up near Amadeus's large, ornate tent. So, instead, Angie and I set about setting up the protective circle. I won't bore you with the details, my process probably wouldn't work for you anyway. We dug a small trench around the campsite and filled it with the items I would use to seal the circle. If this sounds dumb to you, it sounds dumb to me now too. When I look back on it through the lens of time, I realize I was no less deluded than the rest of them, but that's kind of the code of silence in those communities. Even if you think someone is full of shit, you keep your mouth shut because you don't want them to call you on your bullshit. If you're lucky, you grow out of it. If you're not, you become like Amadeus and his little harem. Hopefully not literally, though. By the time we finished, I was sweaty and ready to settle down for the night. Angie had actually been a pretty big help, and as we talked, I had learned that she had grown up in this community. One of the women, whose hair was very similar to Angie's, kept bringing us water, and I started to suspect that Angie might be her daughter. We set up the ingredients and as we finished, I instructed her to start lighting the sage bundles I had placed every few feet. Once they were smoking, I lit the stick and leaves I had put in there too, and hoped they would create a smoldering circle that would last until morning. When we stepped back inside, I spoke some pseudo-Latin, made some vaguely mystic hand gestures, and declared the circle closed. That seemed to be enough for the coven, and they began to set up around the fire pit. The coolers, as it turned out, were full of beer. The woman brought out a large pot full of soup makings and set it on a hanger over the fire. Amadeus brought out a trunk from his tent, 
and I saw them passing out baggies of what I assumed were drugs. Mushrooms seemed to be the drug of choice, but there were a lot of pipes being lit and more than one person snorting something off the back of their hand. A group of young men were listening to Amadeus Wax Philosophical, and he leaned over to let me know that my secondary duties for the evening could begin now. I sighed. I guessed I was on guide duty. I'd played the guide before at gatherings like this, and it's rarely fun once people start using drugs and getting drunk. I guess designated adult sounds less fun than guide, but that was essentially what I was there to do. My job was to make sure that no one wandered off into the woods, no one slept on their back and drowned in their own vomit, and no one tried to jump into the fire. Amadeus and his flock drank heartily and used heavily, but I was surprised at how tame a gathering it was. Amadeus and the five or six young men were pretty much weighted on hand and foot by the two dozen women, and Angie seemed to think it was her job to do the same for me. I had soup when I wanted it, despite me telling her I could get it myself. She also intercepted anyone who tried to offer me a beer or a drug and kept a bottle of water close at my hand. She helped me the two or three times I needed to keep someone from tripping into the circle and was a delight to talk with. She was knowledgeable about a lot of the same things that I was, and I found myself having a good time, despite being an outsider in what was likely a cult gathering. I had just made a Kool-Aid joke in my head when the soup pot was taken away, and three women carried out a heavy iron vessel that they hung in its place. It was ugly and ill-made, not the beautiful thing that you usually think about for these sorts of things. It looked like a big teapot so much as anything, and the woman started shoving bundles of herbs into the top of it. I had no idea what kind of herbs they were, and when I asked Amadeus, he just winked at me and tittered. I told him that if they were planning to flood the campsite with smoke, I wouldn't be able to guide them if I was under the influence of whatever was in that pot too. He snorted, the smoke isn't for you or us. The smoke is to entice the spirits. He called everyone close and set them around the fire as the kettle began to heat up, and the smoke started creeping out. Good evening, my children. The meal has been eaten, and the circle has been set by our most generous guide. This was followed by applause, and I nodded half-heatedly. Now, for the reason we are all here. This smoke will attract the spirits that dwell in this forest, and we will be free to view them from a safe distance as they will be unable to cross our barrier. The smoke had begun to increase a bit, and I could see it making its way up the spout and across the campsite. It smelled terrible, like burning syrup, but it didn't seem to have much of an effect on anyone. Most of them were already tripping on mushrooms or any number of other things, and the smoke did little more than make them wrinkle their noses. As it began to billow out, the herbs catching fire, Amadeus continued to talk about philosophy and magic and a good number of other things. His followers sat dutifully, hanging on his every word, and I tried to be polite as I checked my phone to see if I had any service. To no one's surprise, I had no bars, so I put it away and tried to act interested in Amadeus's impromptu TED talk. It was about 30 minutes later that I started hearing the noises in the woods. The smoke was pretty thick by then, Amadeus giving his dissertation in a fog bank, when I started hearing noises. I mentioned this to Amadeus, and he got pretty excited. He instructed his followers to start chanting, taking it up first as they started copying him in a shaky, undulating tone. I got up and went to the edge of the circle, kind of figuring the smoke had upset some of the natural wildlife, and I wanted to see what we had attracted the attention of. It was midsummer and the idea that we had pissed off a bear or a small group of coyotes or feral dogs was not outside the realm of possibilities. I stood at the edge of the circle, not wanting to break it and mess up the protective magic, and squinted out into the dark woods. Now, if you've never been camping out in the real woods, the first thing you come to realize is that it's really dark out there. I know that sounds obvious, 
but it's a different kind of dark than your normal city dark. The woods really only have to deal with the intrusion of the moon at night, and with the campfire starting to come down off its normal roar, it was very dark outside the circle I had made. I squinted and looked, but honestly, a bear could have swiped my face off before I saw him. I could hear something crunching around out there, something that sounded big. I returned to the fire, the flock still chanting and ululating, and I could hear the crunching noises coming from several points at once. He has heard our call, Amadeus rejoiced. That was when the trees started shaking. Out in the woods, I could see the shadows of trees being shaken and pushed violently. Limbs were snapping all over the place, and as they shook, there was an underlying sound accompanying it. Something was scraping the tree's bark being peeled away angrily as whatever it was, whatever they were, kept battering the trees around the campsite. I say they because it wasn't just one tree that was shaking. It was two, then three, then seven, and before long, it seemed like the whole forest was trying to get up and leave. Above the sound of shaking trees and snapping limbs, I could hear animal sounds too. I could hear dogs, cats, birds, the grunt of deer, the growls of a bear, the snort of horses, and all of it around the campsite. I've been present for some weird shit, shit that makes me feel pretty secure in my beliefs about something being out there. But this was different. This was downright terrifying. The flock, however, is ecstatic. This is apparently what they had been waiting for, and they quickly moved to the edge of the circle so they could see what they had come to see. I, however, went back to my tent to get something out of my duffel bag. I was kind of done with this, the magic having gotten pretty real pretty quick, and I wanted to see what exactly was out there. I still figured our smoke had pissed off a herd of deer or maybe a wild dog pack, maybe even a bear, and I didn't want to suddenly become dinner for something big and angry. I had packed a big deer spotting light that my dad had given me last Christmas, and I wanted it right now more than I had ever wanted anything in my life. When I came out with it, I lit up a big section of woods and started hunting. One of the boys that had been sitting with Amadeus slapped it out of my hand about 20 seconds later, but that was 15 seconds longer than I needed. When I had seen the deer, I almost breathed a sigh of relief. Well, not a deer. Not really. It had antlers, so I guessed it was actually a buck. The antlers, however, were long, and the tines sort of wound together like vines. It was up on its hind legs, scrapping its hooves against the tree in a way that I thought was kind of strange for a deer. I had heard of young bucks rubbing their antlers against trees, mostly to get the velvet off or to scratch an itch, but I had never really heard of them rubbing their hooves against trees. When it turned its head to look at the light, its eyes glowed like a dog's in a camera flash. When it turned its head, I could see that half the velvety skin was torn, showing the muscles of its face and the bone beneath. I took all this in before the light was slapped out of my hand, and I backed away from the circle, suddenly wanting none of this. People were standing around the edges of the circle, and as I backed away, I saw someone step over the trench and walk into the woods. Others followed suit, stepping into the ditch and snuffing out the sage. This would create holes in the circle. This would allow whatever was out there to come into our campsite. In my mind, we were breached already, and this job had just become pretty dangerous. I am completely unashamed to say that I went to my tent, dug the padlock out, padlocked my tent from the inside, and stayed there until morning. As I pulled the sleeping bag up around me, I could hear people outside the tent. From the dancing fire pit, I could see shadows of things in the campsite as well. Some of them were on two feet, but some of them walked on four feet. Some of the people out there laughed, others cried, and a few were definitely screaming as they plunged into the dark woods. I shivered with fear till morning, and when the sun came up, I collected my things and got out. The campsite wasn't some sacrificial pit, though. I could see people lying around the campsite, 
Some in various states of undress, an area around the bonfire was trashed. Coolers were smashed, beer cans were stomped and torn, and vegetables and food packages lay strewn everywhere. Of Amadeus, there was no sign. I never saw him again, and Patrick said no one had heard from him after that night. His coven dissipated after that, and I never heard from any of them again either. I was never paid the other half of my fee, but I suppose that was fitting. I had failed to guide them, and their ritual had gone astray. All I know is that I ran the mile back to my car and never looked back. I did a little research of my own when I got home. Turns out there have been a lot of weird happenings in those woods. People have reported seeing lights in the sky, hearing strange noises, hearing animals that aren't native to this region, and a feeling of overall dread felt by those who stay there overnight. People have gone missing in those woods too, and authorities have never found a trace of them. I'm not going to sit here and claim that I had some kind of paranormal experience out there. I'm not going to tell you that I saw a skinwalker, a wendigo, an alien, or anything like that. I'm not going to tell you that I saw a ghost, a cryptid, or any of that either. What likely happened was that Amadeus was burning some sort of psychotropic drug in that kettle, and we all experienced a group hallucination or something. These are the things that I saw, and these are the things that I told my friends as we sat drinking around our yearly bonfire that night. And after I told them my story, more than a few of them moved inside. I guess maybe the dark dark outside my cabin was a little too dark now. Second story. I lost my dog in the woods. What came back was terrifying. I used to live in the outbacks in Cecilia, Kentucky. There's a lot of woods around and many wild animals which usually gives me a pretty good feeling every day. Well, almost every day. Before I get into it, let me give you some pointers of my property so you can better understand this situation. Where I live is rather secluded. The closest town is a good 30-minute drive away, making my old bus rides over an hour long in the mornings, and our neighboring houses are rather spaced out. The property is pretty nice considering we built the house ourselves. We have a small garden, a chicken coop area, rabbit hutches, and a pig pen. My family's two dogs protected these animals, while mine stayed with the pigs, since one was pregnant at the time. We only have about six acres of backwoods land before we reach a no hunting, private property sign with barbed wire fencing, though it does no good as I later found out a tree had fallen and broke part of it. Now, although we hear coyotes all the time, we never actually find signs of them. Just raccoons, rabbits, squirrels, and a possum prince, and lots of deer tracks. Going out there during late fall, all winter, and beginning of spring was something I genuinely enjoyed doing, though my family had restrictions, as I wasn't allowed out there at night time. Now, while most would find it disturbing maybe, whenever an animal of ours died, I was required to take it out back and dump it near that fence to make sure no predators get too close to our property. The walk through the woods was usually fun, but I did sometimes feel like I was being watched. Of course, karma... My male German Shepherd mix was always with me when I did this task. I never had him on a leash, something I deeply regretted after that night. I brought him because I trust his senses more than my own. Whenever I get the sense I am being watched, Karma will just stop walking. When I see the fur on his back raise, I'll toss the animal as far as possible and head back home. Can never be too careful, right? Now that I have explained something, I'll get on to the point of the story. One of our prized roosters had died suddenly and we hadn't noticed it dead in the chicken coop floor until it was time to put the chickens up for the night. When my older brother opened the back, we saw it dead. We assumed this explained why Cookie, one of the family Pyrenees dogs, was acting odd. Even though it was about 7 p.m. and I didn't want to go in the woods since it was still early fall, which meant big spider web still. My mother demanded I go take it out to where it's supposed to go. 
I got on my boots and sweater to prevent mosquito bites and headed out to get my dog. His pin with the pig was only a few feet away from the back steps, so it was easy to get to him if there was an emergency, like our neighbor's damn dogs chasing our cats. Once I opened the pin, he shot out, excited to run around as I held the Walmart bag with the dead rooster inside. Making my way to the woods, he knew where we were going and followed quickly at my side before getting in front of me. He did that often, going off and stopping to wait for me. As a 17-year-old with no friends, besides internet ones, I found this to be rather sweet of him and would smile at the fact he'd wait, as if he didn't want me to be left alone. I'm coming. I'm coming. I chuckled as I saw him standing at the bottom of the small hill, just staring at me in anticipation. Once down, I kept walking, keeping an eye on him. Once I got closer to the drop-off area, I noticed he was straying further and further away and wasn't stopping. So, I let out a high-pitched whistle sound. Usually, he comes when I whistle, but this time, he didn't. He raised his head up, ears perked up, and his attention was elsewhere. The fur on his back had raised slightly. Before I had a chance to yell no, he bolted. He was never really a barker unless a stranger was in our yard or our neighbor's dogs ran over. So it surprised me when he barked once before suddenly taking off into the woods. It was then that I noticed the tree had fallen when he jumped onto the tree and over the fence to the private property, chasing whatever it was he had seen. Karma. Karma no. I yelled as I dropped the bag and chased after him. Only stopping when I reached the fence but he was nowhere to be seen and his barking stopped. This scared me as it was getting dark out and the day animals were falling silent, being replaced by crickets and frogs. I knew I wasn't allowed on the private property, so I stood at the fence and repeatedly called for him. Here, boy. I called out, feeling frustrated. Come here, now. I yelled, in hopes he would return as the tears began forming in my eyes. Come back. Only for him not to return. I'm naturally a rational thinker and assumed he had gotten too far away to hear me, so I bolted back towards home, feeling out of breath by the time I got up the small, but steep, hill. Mother. I called out as I rushed inside. He took off, and I don't know where he is. He jumped the fence back there. I told you to keep him on a leash when out there. She yelled as she got ready to go help me find him, only to see the sun was basically down. It sets in our backyard, meaning it would be dark in the woods, since the trees would be blocking the sun. I'm sure he'll come back. She assured me, while looking out the back door. Since it was too dark out back, I decided to walk down the street and call for him. My neighbor had noticed and asked if I was looking for someone, so I told him my dog had ran off in the woods. He nodded and seemed to glance around before disappearing to his backyard. I wasn't really sure if he was going to keep an eye out or not. It had been about two hours since he ran off, and he still wasn't back. I mentally cursed myself for not having him on a leash as I went outside to feed the livestock dogs. When scooping their food, I thought I heard a high-pitched whistle. My mind was too focused on the fact karma was still missing to really think about it as I walked around to the backyard. When I got to Cookie, I heard the faint sound of a what sounded like someone in our backwoods saying here boy very quietly, like he was far away or something. I glanced over, but saw nothing besides what the moon showed. Our back porch light wasn't working currently, so it wasn't much that I could see. We had just gotten new with siding up in the backyard, so we had to remove the light. Deciding to ignore it, I walked over to Sarge and gave her her food when I heard it again. Only, it was louder this time. I looked over to the woods again, feeling uneasy before heading inside. I had two thoughts running through my mind, aside from karma of course. One, there was someone in our woods, potentially a neighbor, and two... He seemed to have lost a dog, like I did. Although a stranger, 
I still felt the urge to help as I had just lost my dog in those woods too. Mom, I said as I went inside. There's someone in the woods, I told her, ushering her to come listen. She stopped doing the dishes and went out to listen as well, hearing it as well. The man never called the dogs named, something I didn't notice at the time, and just proceeded to say, Here boy, come back, and come here, now. My mom gave me a wide-eyed look as she looked just as scared as I did when I first heard it. I think we should go help, I said as I grabbed my Winchester BB gun. The actual guns were in the locker that I had no access to, so this would have to do for protection. Should we? She had asked, before we heard a dog. My heart lifted as I hoped it was karma, but it was a hound dog it sounded like, and it was getting further away. Mother's instincts seemed to kick in as she went out there with me. We both knew the dangers of the woods at night, and she began calling out for the dog. I also called out, but I was calling for karma really as we headed into the tree lean, not wanting to go down too far. We noticed as we stopped just before the hill that things were way too quiet. Sure, we heard some nighttime insects, but as we heard the man call out again, he sounded closer, even though the dog's barking was faint and clearly far away. The leaves on the ground were basically dead, yet there was no crunching noises as whoever was out there was getting closer and closer. There was no flashlight shining around either. When our neighbors lost their cat, we saw their flashlights in the woods, so we became skeptical of the fact this strange man we heard didn't have one, and we stopped calling out. Turning around, we headed back up the small path and into the safety of the yard. Our dogs wagged their tails at the sight of us, but it wasn't the same without my dog. We walked along the tree line, staying a few feet back as we looked for some form of light, but found none. It was then we heard it. Come here, boy. In a deep, angry voice. It sounded like it was down some, to our right. I felt the hair rise on the back of my neck and rushed back to the house as our dogs began barking like crazy. Their snarled growls being the only noise as everything else was silent. Mother wasn't far behind as we got inside and closed the door. Staring out as we turned out the lights inside so if the man entered our yard, he couldn't see us as we stayed at the glass door. As I thought of how weird this all was, I realized something. He never said the name of what he was looking for. In fact, he said the same words I had said earlier when karma had ran off. Was he copying me? My thoughts were interrupted as I heard mother gasp and cover her mouth before she closed the curtains to the door. Her tan complexion had gone pale. Without thinking, I took a peek as I could hear one of our dogs going mad crazy. I saw her lounging and growling so I looked to where she was looking. What I saw was not human. I, I don't even know what it was. Its skin was white. The moon wasn't even needed to see. It was so pale that I was sure it was a ghost at first. Its eyes sunken into its face. It didn't seem to have a nose and it looked like it was upside down. Crawling on its hands and feet as it was doing a crab walk sort of, but its head was upright. Back arched so its stomach was pointing up to the sky as it slowly made its way from the tree lane. Its teeth didn't even fit in its mouth as its jaw hung open, a long slimy tongue hanging out as its dark beady eyes looked around. Here boy. It spoke. Come here, boy. It just kept saying. Its head twitching as it turned halfway shakily before snapping back upright. It didn't even seem to care about the dogs barking at it. Then, it looked at the house, and I swear for a second that we made eye contact. I couldn't move for the fear that it would see the curtain movements. For what seemed like an eternity, we were just staring at one another until it twisted its body slowly. Bones seeming to crack and pop as it began standing on its legs. This, this, whatever it was, was tall. Tall, bony, and its skin was tied around its frame showing every bone in its disgustingly lanky body. Some hair hung from its elbows, patches splotched around its chest. 
Its arms were long and almost seemed to drag on the ground. Long, sharp nails were seen. They were black, but the moonlight made them seem to shine slightly. Its body proportions were just so off. It had regular leg size, a bit torso-like its spine grew crooked, and those long arms. It stood at least eight feet tall, and I was petrified. How was it able to just twist its body like that? How was a creature like this even alive? I felt like I was going to piss myself at the sight of this thing. Is this what Karma went after? Did this kill him? My thought stopped when it began walking towards our house. Taking slow strides as its body seemed to sway with each small step it took. Here, boy. Its voice croaked, though it was hard to hear through the glass. My hand that held lightly to the curtain was shaking as I felt myself unable to look away as I felt like those eyes were staring back at me. A flashlight suddenly shone around our backyard. Our neighbor was heading over I assumed, based on the direction it was coming from. He must have heard out dogs going ballistic and came to check it out. God, I thought he was going to get attacked and mutilated, but the creature screeched and ran back into the trees. Even after it left, I was stuck just staring into the trees until the dogs turned their attention to the front yard. Did it circle around? Slowly, I finally stepped away and looked to the door as I heard a knock. My knees felt so weak as I released a breath I wasn't aware I was holding. Mom had answered the door, and it was our neighbor explaining that he had heard our dogs going crazy, just like I thought. I didn't hear much of the conversation as I felt sick and ran to the bathroom, emptying the contents of food I had eaten just hours before. Mother questioned me later that night before bed about what I saw, and I couldn't answer. She saw it too, but only a glimpse. She didn't see the way it moved, the way it stared at me. Later that night around 2 a.m., our neighbor gave us a call, saying he saw our dog in his backyard. I ran out back, hoping it really was him, and there he was, strutting over to us with his tail between his legs as he knew he was in trouble for running off. Yet, I couldn't be mad. I was just glad that whatever that thing was hadn't gotten to him. I moved shortly after that experience and now live in the city. I guess I thought that by writing this out, the nightmares would stop, but they haven't. I can't get the image of those eyes burning into mine out of my mind. I've also written this as a warning. If you lose your dog in the woods and hear some unfamiliar voice calling for it when you thought you were alone, run. Even if you have a group of friends or family, run. Go home and stay away from the windows. There's no telling what it might do if it actually catches you. Third story. Something followed me home from the woods. So... I have always been a level-headed guy and can normally find a rational explanation for most things. But this, this I cannot find an explanation for. I suppose I should start at the beginning. Just before Christmas me and my friend who we will call Sam did our normal hike and camp out that we do every year. We normally go to the same areas to camp, but this year we decided to try somewhere new. Nowhere far off the grid but somewhere where we wouldn't really come across many other people. The day started off as normal. We sorted out Kit out the night before, and I picked him up at 7 a.m. As always, he was running late, but that was nothing new. We headed off at about 7.30 a.m. for the two-hour drive to the area we were going to hike and camp. The drive there was nothing out of the ordinary. The Christmas traffic was heavy until we reached the small town and the Cotswolds. We took the quiet country roads and parked up in a laby and unloaded our kit. Where we were, hiking is, an area surrounded by hills and some forests, we decided to walk the hills and then camp in the woods as it would provide a bit more shelter from the biting wind and the snow that was starting to fall. A bit of bad weather has never deterred us before, and it wasn't going to stop us this time. We walked the hills without any incident, passing a couple of other brave hikers in the wind and the snow. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. We decided to find a place to set up camp for the night. 
We made our way down one of the less steep hills and into the forest. We walked for about 30 to 40 minutes until we came to a relatively flat area under the cover of the trees. It was dry thanks to the canopy above us, which meant we had plenty of dry wood to make fire to keep warm. We set up camp quickly and started on gathering firewood, ready to settle for the night. The night was pretty uneventful. We ate and chatted until the fire started to die down. The snow was coming down thick and heavy now. The forest was silent all bar the crackle of the fire. About 10 p.m. Sam decided he was going to hit the hay. I decided to have one more cigarette before heading to my tent myself. About halfway through I heard a branch snap to my right. Beyond where we had the tent set up, I didn't think anything of it at first. Thought it was just an animal moving through the brush, a rabbit or a deer. It happened again slightly closer this time. It was odd as I thought that an animal would be put off by the fire or even the sight of myself. By the time I had finished my cigarette I hadn't heard anything else so I headed to my tent. Within 10 minutes of my head hitting the pillow, I was asleep. A few hours later I woke up and looked around, it was still dark, so I knew it couldn't be the morning, I fumbled around in my tent until I found my phone. 3 a.m. The forest was still deathly silent. That was until I heard crying. At first, I thought it was Sam. The closer I listened, I realized it was the cry of a child. What was a child doing out here at night in the cold? I slipped my trousers on and stepped out the tent into the cold, crisp air. The fire was dead, and it was pitch black. I turned the torch on on my phone and started to look around. A fresh layer of snow lay now across our campsite, untouched, all except a set of animal prints. Odd I thought, but there were 100 different reasons an animal could have walked through our camp. I shone my torch around more, hoping to catch a glimpse of the child. Nothing. Maybe I was going crazy and it was just a calling of a bird that I heard that sounded like the child. I shook my head and laughed at what an idiot I was thinking I heard a child crying in the woods at 3 a.m. I decided whilst I was up that I would have another cigarette then head back to sleep. I reached into the tent to grab them and my lighter. A branch snapped again behind me, sounding a lot closer this time than previously. I spun around quickly, shining my torch towards the sound. That is when I noticed it, the prints in the snow. They looked like hoof prints, but they didn't look right. I couldn't put my finger on it at first, then it hit me, they were made by a two-legged animal. They led straight out of the camp and into the forest where the branch snapping sound came from. I froze, just staring at the area, my torch shining into the woods, hoping to catch a sight of the animal. That's when I heard it again, the crying child, behind me in the forest. This time it sounded a lot closer. I turned slowly bringing the torch around with me. A branch snapped again from where the crying came from, nothing there. It was at this point I was really starting to question my own sanity. Do I wake Sam? Do I just climb back into my tent and go back to sleep? Was this all a dream? All these questions and more raced through my mind. Then the crying rang through the night again, this time to my left. Followed by, help me, can't have been more than a whisper, but in the silent forest air, it echoed. Hello? I asked, trying to sound confident, but ended up more of a whimper. Is there someone there? I stuttered again. Silence. I stood there for what felt like hours, waiting for an answer, waiting for something to happen. A sharp burning sensation hit my fingers. The cigarette I had lit had burned right down and had started to burn my fingers. Fuck. I hissed as I dropped it on the floor. Another crack echoed through the forest. To my right, I spun quickly looking towards the source of the sound. I swear I saw a tall figure move between the trees. Then the child's voice cut through the air again. Please, help me, it cried. It sounded close, far too close for comfort. I turned slowly to the location of the voice. Nothing. Where are you? I shouted. Silence. 
I heard Sam stir in his tent, hoping he would wake up and come out so I knew I wasn't going crazy. I stood there, waiting for something to happen, for Sam to wake up, the child's voice. Something. The torch on my phone cut out. I looked it and pressed any button I could. No battery. Fuck. I slowly reached into my pocket and pulled out another cigarette. My nerves were a wreck. That mixed with the cold my hands were shaking. I put it in my mouth and sparked the lighter. The small flame cut through the dark. That is when I saw it. The figure in the dark stood tall just behind Sam's tent. Hunched over staring at me, eyes locked in on me, not moving. Its arms seemed to go on forever, claws long and sharp. I saw it smile with broken yellow fangs. It seemed to be covered in fur, but it was hard to tell. It then spoke to me. Won't you help me? It whispered in the child's voice. I just froze. Its green eyes not moving off me. I had Sam's tent open and his torchlight cut through the night and it was gone. Branches breaking beyond Sam's tent. Dude, what the fuck are you doing? It's 3 a.m. and you have no shirt on. He asked. I just stood there, frozen to the spot. What had I just seen? Sam came over to me and grabbed my shoulder, shaking me. I eventually realized what was going on and ended up spending the night in his tent. I couldn't sleep alone that night, if I slept at all. The next morning, we left, got back in the car, and got the fuck out of there. I tried to explain to Sam what I saw, but however I described it, it didn't make any sense. I settled on telling him I had a bad dream and had sleepwalked and didn't feel well which is why we had to leave. This all happened a week ago. Last night I was getting ready for bed and through the door to the garden, I heard it. The child's voice and the figure. It has followed me home. It is out there now, watching. Asking for help. Fourth story. Grandpa taught us not to poach. When my brother and I were younger, maybe five and six, our grandpa took us out hunting with him. He was red-green colorblind and couldn't see the blood trail of the deer if it had gotten away. As we trekked through the woods on his private property, he began telling us what to look for. Deer tracks, scat, antler rubbing on individual trees, and the like. Basic hunting knowledge for Midwesterners as ourselves. I forget who pointed it out, but there was this print that looked too big to be from a deer. At first glance, I had thought that one of the neighbor's cows got loose since they had similar hooves to deer. Grandpa told us to ignore it, that it was just best to not think about it. My brother and I were quiet for the rest of the hunt. We didn't get anything, but Grandpa wasn't disappointed. He was proud of us for being as quiet as we were. When we entered his house, my grandma asked if we saw anything. Being naive children, we told her about the large print. Everyone went still and stared at us as if we had committed a crime against humanity. Grandpa ushered us into the living room and sat us down on the couch. There he began to tell us a story. Back in the days before you or I there were men who were in the fur trade. These men had guidelines of when to kill what animal. And most of these men followed the rules. However, in every barrel of apples there's always a few rotten to the core. The few rotted people were greedy and took more than what nature offered, killing animals out of season, younglings, and some not even born. These men are known now as poachers killing for the sake of killing and sometimes for treasures. One day a group of poachers were found skinned and gutted hanging from trees while a large out-of-season animal lay dead surrounded by the gore. There was no sign of bullet wounds on the men. No animal could have killed the men in this manner. The natives spoke of the guardian protecting Mother Earth's children. Though it was all superstition, some say it was the original fur traders protecting the land they cultivated, and others say it was the spirits of the animals that they had killed. Though the only one makes the most sense. My brother and I sat on the edge of our seats never had we seen Grandpa as serious as he was today. That in itself frightened and excited us. Wendigo. That was the word he used. 
I would find out what a Wendigo was until my teen years while watching a fake documentary series on various cryptids. He left it at that as our parents had come to take us home. As I looked out into the forest, a buck deer skull stared back with piercing red eyes. I never hunted, nor have I been in those woods again. Sometimes as I drive by those woods, I can still see those glowing red eyes that haunted my dreams as a child. The lesson was clear, and I followed it, and now it's up to you. Fifth story. I was attacked while camping in the woods. I'm a 24-year-old man. I live in a rather remote and rural town in Michigan. I especially enjoyed going out in the forest near my small town. On one particular camping trip that I will never forget, I encountered something that made me question the true nature of reality. On one particular day around six years ago, I decided to go out in the nearby woods. It was the summer after I graduated from high school. The hardware store that I was working at went out of business a week prior to this story. Since I lost my job and I was bored, I decided to go on a four-day shooting and camping trip. I packed up my shotgun that my grandfather gave to me for my 16th birthday. For food, I got some ramen noodles, a carton of eggs, graham crackers, and hot dogs. I also packed up a sleeping bag and a tent. So I got into my old pickup truck and drove to the forest. I parked in a nearby grassland and I walked into the woods with my gear. It took me around three hours to find a perfect place to set up camp. I rested for another two hours before I decided to go find somewhere to fire off some rounds. I had this uneasy feeling that I was being watched. No matter how hard I tried, I could never shake it off. Sometimes I heard twigs snapping or footsteps behind me. But when I went to investigate, nothing was there. So I just went back to my business, putting up some used milk jugs as targets for me to shoot. I spent maybe an hour or two shooting my shotgun. Afterwards, I cooked up the ramen noodles for dinner. It got dark pretty quick and I decided it was time for me to fall asleep. So I unfolded my sleeping bag and closed my eyes. As soon as I was fading off into sleep, I heard a deep demonic growl. I quickly grabbed my shotgun and loaded it in preparation to defend myself. Suddenly, something slashed at my tent. The slash tore a very large hole in the tent's fabric. I respond by firing three shots at the intruder. The intruder let out a very high pitch and ear-piercing scream. The assailant screamed so loud that it drowned out the gunshots. Whatever attacked my tent scurried away in the other direction. I was too frightened and shaken up to give chase. My ears felt like they were bleeding, both from the thing's screams and gunshots of my shotgun. I spent the rest of the night sitting next to a tree with my shotgun in my hand. I did not get a good look at my would-be attacker due to how dark it was out. However, from the brief glimpse of the silhouette that I got, the figure seemed quite humanoid, but it definitely was not a human. That thing was also most certainly not a bear, as it was far too skinny and gonna be one. Whatever it was, it was very thin to the point that it looked like someone who was severely malnourished. I don't know if my eyes were playing tricks on me or not, but I swore that the assailant had a coyote-like head. The morning came, and I investigated the area for any signs of my late-night visitor. For some strange reason, there wasn't any blood near my camp. I know for a certain fact that I actually hit that thing at nearly point-blank range. After walking around the area for a few minutes, I discovered some footprints. They were definitely bipedal, but not human. The footprints had four toes with very large dagger-like claw marks on each end. My guess is that they came from my little friend. I panicked, and I decided it was time to leave. So I started to pack up all of my gear. The tent, due to it being too badly damaged to be useful from last night's attack, was simply left behind. I carefully scanned my environment for the creature. After I packed up all of my stuff, I started the long walk back to my truck. A camping trip just wasn't worth facing whatever that was. As I was walking, 
I carefully watch the environment around me. I scanned every body of water and every tree I could see for signs of that monster. There was always that unsettling feeling in my gut that I was being watched. What put me on edge the most was the forest was completely silent. Not a single bird was singing or even an insect chirping. All the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. After nearly three hours of walking in the forest, I suddenly heard loud crunching noises coming from behind me. When I turned around to look, it was the same creature from the night before. The creature looked like a decomposing corpse, with its rib cage and internal organs visible. It had a rotting coyote-like head, but with ratty human-like head hair that touched its shoulders. The creature's claws were around four inches long. It was so skinny that it looked like it hadn't eaten anything for an entire month. It was mostly hunched over, but I think it would have been around six feet two inches feet tall fully erect. Most chilling of all were its piercing eyes that seemed to stare deep into my soul. I fired another round at the creature with my shotgun, but this time it was unfaced. Realizing that my gun was now useless against the creature, my flight instincts took in and I ran for my life. Within no time, the creature ran right behind me. I felt the creature's heavy breathing on my neck. Just when all of my hope was lost, I saw my truck just across the grass. I was within yards of the forest's end. However, even with all of my adrenaline pumping, I was deeply fatigued and exhausted from all that running. Despite nearly fainting, I summoned enough energy to sprint to my truck. Just as I reached my truck, I felt a heavy blow hit the left side of my body. I was sent flying a few feet. When I landed on the ground, I ended up spraining my leg pretty badly. The creature walked over to me. It then grabbed my shirt's collar with one hand and hoisted me up in the air. I pulled out my knife and stabbed it in the face. The creature dropped me on the ground. I grabbed the shotgun and started beating the creature with the butt of my gun. After seeing me fighting back, the creature scampered back into the trees as if it had its tail between its legs. After the creature fled, I limped back to my truck. I put all of my gear in the truck's bed, climbed inside, and sped off as fast as I could. I never returned to that part of the forest again. Knowing that they wouldn't believe me, I also never told my family what happened. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinion slash suggestions in the comments section and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.